Anybody here uh, remember U.S. News and World Report? Oh, you remember that old magazine? Now it's just online. But it used to be at the end of, or in some section of U.S. News and World Report. They had a section called News You Can Use. Uh, that publication has totally gone digital now. And so I got online just to find out if there was anything that would fit under that category. And I found a couple of interesting things. One of them is that for April, uh, among the 12 best car deals, I happen to be interested in things like that, uh, the 12 best car deals included a base model Corvette with a 455 horsepower motor, 0% financing for 72 months. There you go. Some of you are thinking, where can I get that right now? Then there was a story about a New Hampshire man who fashioned a surfboard out of 700 Dunkin' Donuts cups, uh, coffee cups, and 30 plastic straws held together by epoxy. And for doing all that, he only got second place in whatever contest he was in. Here's what I'm almost afraid to read to you. It's called Raise a Glass to the Golden Years. This year, researchers at the Clinic for Aging Research and Education in Laguna Hills, California, focused on what food activities and lifestyles are common, uh, commonly featured among those living longer. Analyzing more than 1,600 nonagenarians, that's people who were in their 90s, the study results show that people who drank two glasses of beer or wine a day improved their odds of living longer than those who abstained by about 18%. Exercising regularly and partaking in a hobby for two hours a day were also associated with longer lives. Surprisingly, people who were overweight but not obese in their 70s live longer than normal or underweight people. Yes! <laughs> Life is good. Fat and healthy. Ah, we're talking. That's news you can use, folks. <clears throat> now, if there had been a... If there had been a U.S. News and World Report uh, published in A.D. 33, I wonder if the Jerusalem Bureau would have submitted a report on the resurrection of Jesus. And if they did, it probably would not have been listed under that section, News You Can Use. Now, over 2,000 years later, the resurrection of Christ would hardly be considered news or useful to the average person. I mean, even if it did happen... What possible difference can that historic event make in our lives in 2019? Last week we saw that belief in Jesus' bodily resurrection is central to Christianity. It's essential to Christianity. Matter of fact, it's impossible to be a Christian without believing in the resurrection. Let's do a little review. If you go back with me in 1 Corinthians 15, that's our passage, uh, picking it up in verse 12. Paul says, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Today we're going to discover some very practical differences which this historic event can make in our lives. Why the resurrection is news you can use. So what difference does this make to me? Well, first of all, it clarifies the promise of eternal life. Let's pick it up again in verse 20, 1 Corinthians uh, 15, beginning in verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since uh, death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in turn Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. As I mentioned last Sunday, when we're young and healthy, uh, our immediate families are alive, and our best friends are still close by, the idea of resurrection doesn't seem all that important to us. Because life is filled with birthday parties and holidays and vacations and school programs, recitals, sporting events, graduations, weddings, and church services. We just kind of assume that life as we know it today will go on indefinitely. And all the people in our lives, in their particular place, they're just going to remain there. <clears throat> but when you're by the bedside of a loved one in ICU, and they're plugged into life support, or you're sitting in that funeral director's office planning a service, everything looks different. After that final breath, do they simply cease to exist or are they conscious in some other form? Are they peaceful? Are they happy? 
Are they frightened? Will I ever see them again? Can they see me now? When you're staring death in the face, you need more than a mournful song. You need more than a cliche. You need more than a sympathy card to give you perspective and hope. The oldest book in the Bible records the oldest question of man. And that is, if a man dies, will he live again? If a man dies, will he live again? Paul lays out a sequence of events related to the resurrection, starting with this truth. He is risen. He is risen. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. It's a thrilling story. We review it every Easter. I'm going to ask Kayla Long to come up now and read for us Matthew 28, 1 through 7, as translated by Eugene Peterson in The Message. of the new week dawned. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to keep vigil at the tomb. Suddenly the earth reeled and rocked under their feet as God's angel came down from heaven, came right up to where they were standing. He rolled back the stone and then sat on it. Shafts of lightning blazed from him. His garments shimmered snow white. The guards at the tomb were scared to death They were so frightened, they couldn't move. The angel spoke to the women. There is nothing to fear here. I know you're looking for Jesus, the one they nailed to the cross. He is not here. He was raised, just as he said. Come and look at the place where he was placed. Now, get on your way quickly and tell his disciples, he is risen from the dead. He is going on ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. That's the message. Thank you, Kayla. Now, we know from studying the Bible that Jesus wasn't the first one to rise from the dead. Matter of fact, there are three accounts in the Old Testament of resurrections. The prophets Elijah and Elisha were both involved in resurrections, and they included two sons of widows. Then there was this random thing you can read about in 2 Kings 13, a random case of somebody who was being buried in Elisha's grave, and we're told as soon as he hit uh, Elisha's bones that the guy jumped back to life again. That's a pretty dramatic story, kind of eerie. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus, Paul, and Peter all performed resurrections, including the resurrection of Lazarus and Dorcas, and then Eutychus. Eutychus is that guy who fell asleep during Paul's long sermon, and he died, and Peter actually brought him back to life again, or rather the work of God through him. At the time of Jesus' crucifixion, we have this account from Matthew 27. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. So resurrections took place at the time of Jesus' crucifixion and death as well. But there is something that sets Jesus' resurrection apart from the rest. And that is Jesus arose never to die again. Jesus arose never to die again. Romans 6, 9. Since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. Now that was not true for people like Lazarus. He uh, died. And by the way, there's nothing that will break up a funeral like a good resurrection. And so, you know, people are mourning the death of Lazarus, and then he comes out of the tomb. But he died again, didn't he? Which means that Lazarus had two funerals. Uh, One, as far as I'm concerned, is plenty. Now, along with Jesus' resurrection came the promise that we will rise, each of us in his own turn. Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Now, our resurrection will be like Jesus' resurrection in that we too will rise never to die again, Romans 6. Just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will also certainly be united with him in his resurrection. I've been involved with hundreds of Christian funerals over the years while dealing with the pain and grief that people experience. I'm sure everyone would agree that one funeral is plenty. It's a hard thing to go to to a funeral. But when we rise up 
from the grave, we will stay rizzed. We're going to stay risen. We're going to rise never to die again. But there's another part to this doctrine which isn't so positive, and that is they will be raised. As in Adam, all die, so in Christ, all will be made alive. The all here includes both those who do have a testimony of faith in Christ and those who do not. Literally, everyone who has ever lived and died will be raised to life again. John chapter 5, Jesus said a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live. Those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. Acts 24, there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. I regularly go online and read obituaries. I'm kind of weird that way. So I'll go, uh, our hometown paper, the Oregonian, I call it a paper still, but it's actually an online publication. So I go into the Oregonian, and I look at the obituaries. First, I want to see if my name is there. And uh, then, if there's anybody that I know that's passed away. And then people who are my age or younger, and I find that that list is getting longer all the time. Now, this may seem like a morbid pastime, but I also like walking through cemeteries, so it, it fits. I perused some recent obituaries from the North Platte Telegraph, posted last Sunday. And you may know some of these people, I don't... Terry Frober of Valentine was just 49 years old when he died, and he will be cremated and then buried in Auburn, Washington at a later date. Valerie Mitchell of North Platte was 63. Robert Bob Pinnaker of Paxton was 81. You read the obituaries, and some of these people were connected to a church, and some were not. Some have a testimony of faith in Christ, and some do not. But everyone whose name is listed in those obituaries, will rise from the dead. Every one of them will rise from the dead to either eternal life or to eternal condemnation. One of the greatest ministry challenges is performing funeral services for people where there is not a clear testimony of faith in Christ. And in that situation, you want to comfort the family, you want to give hope to them, and often they expect some assurance that their loved one is, quote, in a better place. I'm not the judge, that position belongs to God, but I relate this truth, Hebrews 9, 27, man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. Revelation chapter 20 gives a picture of what that judgment will be like. I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Now at those funerals, if they don't have a clear testimony of faith in Christ, or a, a track record as a follower of Jesus... What I can't do is offer false hope. So I preach the gospel to those who are still living and trust that they will see their need for a Savior. And then we just say that we, uh, we place the life of the person who has died, the soul of the person who has died, into the hands of a just, omniscient, and merciful God. It's not a question of whether we will have eternal life. The question is, where? Just like real estate, it's all about location, location, location. Not only does the doctrine of resurrection clarify the promise of eternal life, it verifies his position as sovereign Lord. The Greek word for Lord is kurios. It means absolute ruler, master, controller, Someone who deserves absolute obedience, unquestioned loyalty, and respect. We live in a democratic, free enterprise society. And so it's hard for us to understand what it would be like to live under the authority of a king or a potentate. That is a government where might makes right. Mine is not to reason why, mine is but to do or die. There, is no, there are no questions asked. There is no right of appeal when you're operating under a Lord. 
the closest we come to that kind of lordship, the sergeants at boot camp, wardens in prison, and mothers of the bride at weddings. Now, there are some areas of our lives where we might voluntarily submit ourselves to someone's expertise, someone's character. We go to a surgeon and we commit our life to them. We go to an attorney and we trust that he or she is going to give us the right advice that's going to keep us out of jail and, and keep us legal. We go to stockbrokers and we trust them with our money, our financial planning for the future. We go to a therapist and trust that they're going to give us wise counsel. We believe because of their proven ability, their knowledge, their skill, it's greater than ours in that particular area. And so we put our physical health, our reputation, our emotional well-being, or our financial assets in the hands of somebody else. It's no small thing to ask a person to commit his or her life completely to someone else, even in one area, one part of our life, let alone all areas. Why in the world should we entrust our daily lives to Jesus Christ, let alone our eternal destiny? Well, it's because he proved his wisdom by managing his earthly life perfectly. He proved his love by dying on the cross sacrificially. He proved his power by rising from the dead victoriously. What difference does Jesus' resurrection make to me? It means that I can trust him completely. He is ready, willing, and able to take complete control over my life. Through his resurrection, he verified his position as sovereign Lord over the enemies of earth. Let's pick it up in verse 24. Then the end will come <clears throat> when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. What we have in these verses is a kind of timetable. It's a schedule of conquests leading to Jesus' coronation as king over all the earth. The campaign began with his own resurrection. It will continue when he raises the bodies of Christians from our graves at the rapture of the church and he takes us to heaven. Then we're going to be in heaven for seven years while the tribulation is taking place here on the earth. During that time, we're going to be enjoying an incredible banquet, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Next Sunday, we're going to investigate what our new bodies will be like. At the end of those seven years, we're going to return with Christ to earth to fight the most lopsided war in history, the Battle of Armageddon. It truly will be shock and awe. Every principality and power in heaven and on earth will be forced to submit to Jesus. By the way, you may want to brush up on your horse riding skills because that's the way we're coming down, folks. Make no mistake about it. In the end, the good guys beat the bad guys. Justice will be served. Nobody gets away with anything. The Saddam Husseins, the Osama bin Ladens, North Korea's Kim Jong-un and their ilk will be dealt with in righteousness and in truth. Christ will reign on the earth from Jerusalem for a thousand years. He will reverse the curse which God placed on the earth due to Adam's sin. He's going to put everything back into perfect order, physically, morally, and spiritually. By the way, there's a song about this that we love to sing, except we sing it at the wrong time. And it describes the millennial reign of Christ on the earth for a thousand years. It's called Joy to the World. That's not about the first coming of Christ. It's about the second coming of Christ and specifically his reign. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ while fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glory of his righteousness and wonders of his love. The last enemy to be conquered is identified as death. 
after the bloodbath, after the war to end all wars, after the final judgment, death itself will be destroyed. Revelation 21, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. No more terminal diagnosis. No more chemotherapy. No more ICU. No more morphine. No more hospice. No more caskets. No more obituaries. No more funerals. No more cemeteries. No more grief-stricken widows or widowers or children or parents or friends. No more. No more. Jesus said, no more death. That's the promise. Just the hope of death's end can give us a new lease on life. Hebrews chapter 2, since the children have flesh and blood, he too, meaning Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. We are enslaved. That fear of death hangs over us until we come to embrace the resurrection of Jesus. And then the fear can be taken away. Jesus' resurrection verifies his position as sovereign Lord over the enemies of earth and under the authority of heaven. Let's pick it up in verse 27. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that he does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. Some have taken this to mean that there's kind of a, a hierarchy in the Godhead, uh, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I think the real issue here, however, is that there is no division or jealousy within the Godhead. God the Son voluntarily submitted himself to God the Father during his incarnation. And he will do it again at the end of the millennial kingdom. He was going to present all of that back to God again. Who else but a resurrected sovereign Lord of the universe is worthy of our trust, worthy of our worship, worthy of our obedience and service? What difference does the resurrection make to me? It clarifies the promise of eternal life. It verifies his position as sovereign Lord. And finally, it identifies our purpose for godly living. And that surpasses religious ritual. Here's one of the strangest verses in the entire Bible. Verse 29. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? Now, this is the only place in the Bible that makes any reference to being baptized for the dead. This verse has become kind of a thin foundation for some religions, such as Mormonism, who practice proxy or vicarious baptisms for other people. Believers taking the plunge for people who don't know or people who have died. Others have gotten very creative trying to make this verse fit in to their theological understanding. Some have said, well, it's referring to the baptism of those who were spiritually dead. Baptism for the dead. Others have said it's being baptized in the name of Jesus who died for them. Still others say it's a figurative baptism into suffering, sorrow, and death. And finally, it's being baptized due to the testimony of Christian martyrs. After doing quite a bit of study on this, I've come to a conclusion. I have no idea what he was talking about here. And I'm in pretty good company. Dr. John MacArthur said it this way, let me say at the very beginning that I really don't know what it means. But I don't feel bad because no one else does either. The reason is because the passage is so limited and obscure and there isn't a lot of data given to us. There are 35 different views on this one verse that I myself went through when I was doing a paper in seminary. I think he's simply saying that even your own pagan religions affirm the resurrection as a concept. Why else would people be being baptized for dead people if it wasn't in the heart of man to believe in the resurrection? Now, Dr. MacArthur and I both agree with another apostle by the name of Peter who wrote this about Paul. 
2 Peter 3.16, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do to other scriptures to their own destruction. So while I don't know for sure what this verse means, I do know that baptism symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection of his followers. Romans chapter 6. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. Now if you really believe in the resurrection, then you should be eager to follow through with baptism because of what it symbolizes about Jesus and because of what it symbolizes in terms of our life in Christ. And I want to encourage you to do this. I mentioned it last Sunday that we're starting a list and we have several people on that list now who are making the decision to follow the Lord in Christian baptism. And if you know you need to do that, you've never done that, I would encourage you to just write on that card, say, yeah, I need to be baptized. You can check the box or add me to the list. And prior to that, we're actually going to offer a brief study, a brief class talking about baptism, why we do it, how we do it, all those kinds of things. It's so important to understand that. So please let us know if you'd like to be included in that list. Now, another practical way that Christians demonstrate their belief in the resurrection is by taking calculated risks. Pick it up at verse 30. And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought the wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If the resurrection isn't literal, then Paul might as well bag preaching and just go to partying. He didn't enjoy pain and Rejection, worry, conflict, exhaustion, illness, or threat to his life and limb any more than you and I do. It was the hope of the resurrection, the hope of that eternal abundant life that made him willing to risk his earthly life for the cause of Christ. When you truly believe in the resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous, you take some risks. You take some financial risks. You invest in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. You invest in his church. You invest in getting the gospel out throughout the world because there's a death and a burial and a resurrection coming. You take emotional risks. You risk being rejected by unbelievers. You risk being offended and hurt by well-meaning, if not occasionally mean, fellow believers. You take physical risks of going to a foreign land, either short or long term, to preach the gospel or to train others. If you really don't believe in the resurrection, then church and Christianity are mostly about potlucks, parties, and politics. In just two weeks, we're going to celebrate Easter. What are you willing to risk? What are you willing to risk between now and then? so that others could hear the message of eternal life through the resurrected Christ. Would you be willing to risk some time? Would you be willing to risk some energy? Would you be willing to risk being turned down when you invite somebody to join you for one of those three services? In your bulletin today, you'll notice a, an Easter invitation card, and it covers Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and, and Easter Sunday. We have more of those out in the lobby area, and we want you to pick up as many as you need and to just share them with people. Share them with people who don't yet know Jesus. Share them with people who may have fallen away in their walk with the Lord. Share them with Christians who are what we call untended sheep. They're really not connected to a body of believers right now. Use those cards. Take the risk. Of all the risks in the world, this is a pretty low risk, isn't it? But you just take the risk of saying, This is what we're doing. Would you join us? Would you join us for these events? Truth, faith always involves risk. We like to say that worship, true worship, always involves sacrifice. True faith always involves risk. 
Finally, belief in, Jesus, belief in Jesus' resurrection and our own is a primary motivation for developing practical righteousness. Verse 33. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning for there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. The impact of Christ's resurrection doesn't just kick in when we face death. It provides power for daily life. It provides power to overcome temptation, power to resist sin. It gives power for prayer with the resurrected Christ. I love Romans 8.34, Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. At the right hand of God, whispering into God's ears, as it were, requests for us, praying for us. Talked about uh, this transitional season. And we're going to be doing some prayer projects, prayer events during this time. We may organize what I like to call cottage prayer fellowships where people gather in homes and pray together. We may organize some concerts of prayer where we all come together and we blend in scripture and song and praying together. We want to formulate a, a prayer force, kind of like the special forces unit that are bathing this whole transition process in prayer. And this is all going to kind of kick off on Monday, Thursday, a week from this coming Thursday. As the main focus of that is going, it's not going to be a pageant, it's going to be a prayer meeting. Not only are we going to be praying to the risen Christ, we're going to be praying with Him. Because that's what Jesus does. He prays. Wouldn't you love to be in Jesus' prayer group? We can be in Jesus' prayer group when we come together in His name. We get to join Him in this primary ministry. Since the resurrection, that's mainly what Jesus does. We're not going to be performing some religious ritual. We're going to be asking God to empower us in special ways during this season. We're going to ask for His power in taking some calculated risks by faith so that the gospel will be proclaimed throughout this community. We're going to pray that our testimonies and the message is going to be validated by righteous, holy, and Christ-like living. We're going to pray for the continued healing and unification of this body of believers so that there is a stronger testimony for Christ in North Platte and all over the place. We're going to pray that this church will rise up and join the risen Christ in the most profound ministry and mission of all. The incentive for that kind of life, the one we've been talking about and singing about, starts when we're born again by faith, as the song puts it, which we're going to sing in a little while, in Christ alone. Romans chapter 10, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. I'd like us to respond to that passage right now. Whether you've known Jesus for a long time or you're just a new believer, maybe even as of today, I'd like you to make this declaration out loud. Jesus is Lord. Would you say that? Jesus is Lord. Now say it with more conviction. Jesus is Lord. That's the conviction. And if you believe in your heart of hearts that God raised him from the dead, say with me, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. And that's the confession that we make. That's the truth that we live by. If you're inviting Christ to come into your heart today, we want to know about that. And so we're going to pause just briefly right now and pray together. Lord Jesus, we've made a bold confession today that you're Lord and we believe that you are raised from the dead never to die again.